On October 7, 1949, Jean Spangler embarked on a fateful journey. After bidding farewell to her five-year-old daughter, Christina, she left her Park La Brea apartment and vanished into thin air, leaving an indelible void in her daughter's life. Born on September 2, 1923, in Seattle, Washington, Jean Elizabeth Spangler was the beloved daughter of Florence and Cecil Spangler. Her childhood dreams were adorned with aspirations of becoming a model or actress. Upon her graduation from Los Angeles Franklin High School, she promptly pursued a career in modeling. As her career evolved, Jean ventured into the realm of dance, gracing the stages of Florence Gardens and the infamous Earl Carroll Theater. Despite the latter's dubious reputation, it catapulted her into even greater prominence. In 1941, Jean's foray into Hollywood yielded cameo roles in films like When My Baby Smiles at Me, Chicken Every Sunday, and The Piper. Throughout her brief but notable career, she accumulated credits in eight movies, though her presence enriched more than 15 films. Regrettably, her roles were often too minor to merit official recognition. At the tender age of 19, Sheen embarked on a matrimonial journey, joining hands with Dexter Benner, a budding entrepreneur involved in the plastic manufacturing industry. Their age difference was a mere two years, cementing a promising chapter in her life. The marriage between Jean and Dexter was short-lived, lasting only a few months, murdered by Jean's departure due to Dexter's alleged cruelty. Despite their separation, their relationship endured, and approximately a year and a half later, Christina was born. However, in 1946, the couple's tumultuous journey reached its breaking point as they officially parted ways, embarking on a bitter custody battle for their daughter. During this legal battle, Benner asserted that Jean favored social gatherings over the responsibilities of parenthood. Largely owing to his financial resources, Benner initially secured custody of Christina and promptly prohibited Jean from seeing her daughter. Undeterred, Spangler pursued legal avenues, resulting in a reversal of the previous custody decision, ultimately reuniting Christina with her mother. In 1948, Jean and her daughter relocated to a modest three-room apartment in Park La Brea, Los Angeles, where her brother and his wife also resided. A chronology before the disappearance. October 7, 17 o'clock. Jean confided in her sister-in-law, Sophie, about her impending departure. With her mother away on a visit to relatives in Kentucky, Sophie kindly offered to look after Christina in her absence. Jean explained that her purpose for leaving was to meet with Benner, with whom she needed to discuss the long-delayed matter of child support payments. Following this crucial meeting, Spangler planned to dive into an evening of filming for her upcoming movie project. 18 o'clock. An observant witness spotted Jean at the local farmer's market, situated not too far from her apartment. The vendor distinctly recalled her wandering amidst the market stalls, appearing somewhat lost or as if she were in search of someone. 19 o'clock. Jean reached out to Sophie, who was staying at the apartment, to convey that the evening film shoot was expected to extend throughout the night. This deviation from their earlier agreement, which had set midnight as her return time, was discussed during the call. It's probable that Jane was making this call from the farmer's market rather than the movie studio. Regardless of the location, this conversation marked the final exchange between Sophie and Jean. October 8, 130. Several witnesses reported spotting Jean at the Cheesebox restaurant on Sunset Boulevard. She was accompanied by a tall, dark-haired man, and it was evident to onlookers that they were engaged in a heated argument. The final sighting of Jean at this establishment occurred at 2.30 a.m. according to the clock. 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock. An employee at a city gas station had a brief interaction with Jean and an unidentified man when they arrived in a convertible to refuel. As they departed, the woman urgently conveyed a message to the clerk. Please ask the police to tail that car. Subsequently, the gas station employee contacted the police to relay the incident. Unfortunately, given the lack of specific details such as the license plate number or a description of the man, the provided information had limited utility. As morning dawned on October 8th and Jean had not yet returned home, Sophie grew increasingly concerned, sensing that something untoward had befallen her. In response to this mounting anxiety, she took swift action that same morning by reporting Spangler's disappearance to the Wilshire Police Department in Los Angeles. However, due to Jane's profession as an actress in her age, law enforcement initially failed to accord her case the gravity it deserved. Consequently, they refrained from disseminating any news about the search for her. Finding Griffith Park 
Griffith Park, one of the largest urban parks in North America, sprawls across a vast expanse encompassing 17.5 square kilometers. Nestled in the Los Feliz neighborhood at the eastern edge of the Santa Monica Mountains, this expansive park boasts an array of attractions, including an observatory, a zoo, museums, and an amphitheater. However, beneath its serene exterior, Griffith Park harbors a darker, more ominous reputation as a recurring site of murders and the discovery of lifeless bodies. On October 9th, an employee of Griffith Park stumbled upon Jean Spangler's bag near the park's entrance. Within the bag lay her identification and a handwritten note bearing a cryptic message. Kirk, I can't wait any longer. I'm going to see Dr. Scott. It's best to do this while mom is out of the house. Curiously, one of the bag's handles had been torn off, but there appeared to be no signs of a thorough search. Sophie, Jane's sister-in-law, confirmed that Jean had not carried any money with her that day, dispelling the possibility of a robbery-related loss. It was only upon the discovery of Jean's bag that the police began to treat her disappearance with the gravity it deserved. By late afternoon, a contingent of 60 police officers and volunteers had gathered in the park to initiate the search for Jean. Concurrently, investigators commenced efforts to locate witnesses who might shed light on her whereabouts. Intriguingly, Jean had informed Sophie on the eve of her disappearance that she was scheduled for an evening shoot in connection with a new movie. In light of this, the police decided to investigate this lead. However, inquiries with the studio where she worked revealed no record of Jean participating in the evening shoot or even showing up for the event. Ex-husband, the police conducted an interview with Dexter Benner, who revealed that he had not seen his ex-wife in several weeks. His new spouse, Lynn, whom he had married just two months prior, provided him with an alibi for the time in question. Although Benner had admittedly fallen behind on his alimony payments, he vehemently disputed Sophie's assertion that Jean was scheduled to meet with him that evening to discuss financial matters or any related issues. Following Spangler's disappearance, Benner and Jean's mother, Florence became embroiled in a protracted legal battle over the custody of their daughter, Christina. Ultimately, Benner emerged victorious in this legal dispute. Two years later, Dexter and his new wife initiated adoption proceedings in an attempt to formally establish Lynn as Christina's legal mother. Their justification centered on the claim that Jean had abandoned her daughter. However, a judge rendered a verdict, citing a lack of conclusive evidence regarding Jean's fate, and thereby prevented the adoption from proceeding. Subsequently, Benner and his family relocated to Florida and never returned to California. Kirk's lover, following the tumultuous encounter with Jean's ex-husband, law enforcement initiated a series of interviews with her colleagues. Among them was Robert Cummings, her co-star in the film Girl of the Year. During his conversation with investigators, Cummings disclosed a significant detail from a discussion he had with Jean two weeks prior to her disappearance. Jean confided in him that she had recently experienced a deeply fulfilling encounter, describing it as the best moment of her life. Curiously, she didn't perceive this relationship as a serious one and did mention the man's name. Jean's mother, Florence, also provided valuable insights to the police. She recalled her daughter mentioning someone named Kirk, whom she knew to be a colleague from work. Florence further disclosed that this individual, Kirk, had picked up Jean from their home on several occasions. However, he never left his car, and this peculiar behavior struck Florence as odd. A 13-year-old neighbor who was acquainted with Jean added an intriguing yet puzzling detail. She claimed to have observed Jean driving toward North Hollywood with an older man behind the wheel roughly a week before Jen's disappearance. This sighting left the young witness with the impression that Jean appeared quite nervous. Given her personal familiarity with Jean, the police took this testimony seriously although it ultimately did not lead to a breakthrough in the case. For a time, suspicion lingered around actor Kirk Douglas, but it was not given serious consideration as he had minimal acquaintance with Jean, having only crossed paths with her a few times during the filming of Trumpet, a botched abortion. As time elapsed, the Jean Spangler case remained stagnant, devoid of any significant developments. Private investigator Steve Hodel, who had undertaken his own inquiry into the matter, penned a book chronicling his investigation. In the book, he posited an intriguing theory. I believe that Kirk is not a first name as everyone, including the LAPD chief, Ted Brown, who suspected actor Kirk Douglas of the murder thinks. It's actually a last name. Kirk, I believe, was Dr. Eric Kirk, a chiropractor and abortionist. The release of Hodel's book stirred controversy and even led to the brief arrest of Dr. Eric Kirk. 
However, LAPD Captain Ed Jokish took issue with the book's content and penned an open letter to its author. Your book is filled with so much baseless innuendo, misinformation, and logical fallacies that it is impossible to take it seriously, wrote the former police officer Ed Jokish. In a fresh twist, one of Jean's friends eventually disclosed to the police that Spangler had been three months pregnant, a result of an extramarital affair. Armed with this new information, investigators decided to interview all doctors in the Los Angeles area with the last name Scott. Regrettably, none of them had any record of treating Jean. Moreover, the police uncovered the existence of a former medical student known as Doc, hailing from a wealthy family and involved in performing illegal abortions for a fee. However, the veil of secrecy shrouding this enigmatic doctor prevented anyone from sharing information, thwarting the police's efforts to locate him. In another intriguing lead, investigators learned that during Benner's time in the Army, Jean had dated an airline pilot who had allegedly threatened her with harm if she ever left him. This individual was known as Scotty. Unfortunately, this lead too proved unfruitful in the pursuit of answers. The Mafia Given Jean's frequent visits to the Palm Springs area and her recent sightings there just days before her disappearance, the police embarked on a series of interviews with employees of local establishments where Spangler might have been spotted. During these inquiries, detectives unearthed unsettling connection. Jean had been seen in the company of Davy Audula and Frank Nicoli, both known associates of the notorious mobster Mickey Komen. Efforts were initiated to locate Audula and Nicoli, but they mysteriously vanished without a trace. Subsequently, the police received unsettling information suggesting that both men had met a grim fate, allegedly murdered and disposed of at the bottom of the Cucamonga Lime Quarry. Despite these claims, no bodies were ever recovered. Given the formidable power and brutality of the mob, it became plausible that Jean might have inadvertently stumbled upon a violent encounter or worse yet, been kidnapped. Four months later, a customs official stationed in El Paso near the Mexican border asserted that he had seen Jean alive in the company of Nicoli and Aguila. Another witness came forward claiming to have spotted the trio at a nearby hotel and confirming their identities through photographs. Yet the police were unable to conclusively establish whether the woman in question was indeed Spangler, as the trail vanished somewhere in Mexico. Additional witnesses emerged over time but the search for Jean evolved into one of the most extensive manhunts in Los Angeles history, engendering a deluge of false claims that complicated the process of verifying sighting. Ultimately, none of the proposed scenarios, including involvement of her ex-husband, a lover, a botched abortion, or a mob kidnapping, were definitively substantiated. The fate of Jean Spangler remains shrouded in mystery, leaving us with more questions than answers.